Greetings, I'm Solid Scully, and welcome back to Spider-Man 2. Enter Electro. Central Tower, Code Red. <laughs> yeah, Sneaky Spider-Man. And uh, if you're wondering where we are right now, well, in the previous cutscene of the last part couldn't tell you, yeah, we're right back at the beginning of the game, where Electro stole the initial amplifier device, and in turn the laboratory where both Dr. Watts and, it seems, Dr. Connors were working. Hmm, Dr. Kurt Connors. I'm sure there will be no, uh, lizardy antics in this part. Uh, but yeah, it seems that there was also some unsavory research going on here. I'm guessing in a kind of a Metal Gear Solid, uh, Black Budget's Pentagon kind of way, without those, you know, snivel coat fucking anti-war, mm, yes, sir, uh, pippies on the peace committee going, mm, yes, they're just interfering with good business for the next good war, jolly good, mm, yes. Uh, but yeah, we've got kind of a long part of pretty much just sneaking around, doing a couple more missions that aren't really relevant to anything at this point, so... Instead, I'm actually going to be talking about, uh, something in the last part, actually. Uh, the Gala. That uh, was the previous mission where we were saving the hostages and trying to rescue, uh, Dr. Watts. Who, uh, to kind of clarify for a moment, is an Electra, because... Two completely different characters, and I believe Dr. Watson in this game was invented purely for Enter Electro, so, uh... Yeah, no Electra cameo in this game. But anyway, as I was saying earlier, uh, part of the reason why I was also a little bit, uh, raising an eyebrow as I was re-watching the previous part was... Why exactly would you hold a technology gullible, specifically with members of the scientific community that worked on the amplifier device, that by this point, because again it has been a couple of days in between when Electro stole the device and now, why exactly would you have one of their leading scientists at a charity ball that is not only well advertised but in turn, also, done specifically for, well, one of the pieces that Electro needs in order to, com to complete the device. Again, why would you host that so soon after a villain attack? That just strikes me as being very, uh... uh well... It's very careless and, uh, like, I mean, again, I kind of understand this whole comic book thing is like, oh, the Marvel Universe superheroes everywhere. Or maybe it's just the sort of thing where it's like, eh, fuck it, who cares, we need a reason for the plot to begin. By the way, this is a very basic puzzle of your little Venn diagram thing. Whatever, but we also have new webbing! And, uh, by far the most useful webbing in the game, the electric webbing, uh, used primarily to take down a lot of the robot enemies we've been facing, and, uh, yeah, it was quite handy. It's kind of a shame that they didn't actually do more with the webbings. I mean, I kind of mentioned this before with the freeze webbing, where all it does is really just change the aesthetics of your attack rather than giving you any new abilities to speak of. I mean, I don't know, like, I mean, maybe for the impact webbing you could have had some ice shards, or maybe with the, you know, the web dome you could have maybe had, like, a... I don't know, more defense, or you could have kept it around for a bit longer, maybe? Have a few laughs. By the way, that was a, I believe that was a direct shout-out to Die Hard, actually. So, uh... Makes sense. Although, really, it's kind of odd that they didn't use the TV dinner line, actually, because he isn't an airvent at this point, so, uh, hmm, tut tut, vicarious visions. Guess you didn't have, uh, Die Hard on video. Or, actually, no, it was DVD, I think, at this point? Yeah, it would have been, so, uh, scratch that thought. Uh, but I mean, talking about anything else in the meantime, it's, uh, yeah, there's not really too much of interest, it's really just more gameplay for the sake of itself, navigating around the labs that, uh, it seemed to borrow a few assets altered from a uh, Doc Ock and Carnage's lab from the previous game. I mean, uh, okay, that corridor right there is probably a little bit more blatant, uh, minus the lasers and everything, but... It does kind of make me wonder what uh, what sort of a budget this game had, or whether or not this was either a quick throwaway sequel to cash in on, a, on the success of the previous game, or whether or not this game was given a specific budget of its own and they were able to, you know create new stuff with it, because I mean, there are obviously new assets at play and, you know, specific areas for the game. I'm just wondering how much Vicarious Visions really had to work with, or if Neversoft were given, you know, more leeway and creative freedom to create a new Spider-Man game, whereas this one was just Activision going, yeah, we have the license, so uh, Vicarious Visions, money up, give us a new game. 
I mean, granted, that might be a very cynical thought, but... I mean, if that's the case, it kind of feels like this was meant to be a bit of a tie the Spider-Man fans over sort of game, since... Again, Activision did hold the Spider-Man license for quite a number of years, actually, I mean, and uh, they at least held it long enough for them to publish the 2002 movie game. And uh, somewhat cynically, I'm having to wonder whether or not since, again, obviously by 2001, I believe, you know, advertisements and trailers for Spider-Man, uh, the 2002 movie were in effect at this point. Actually, that would have had to have been, because uh, there was actually an old 2002 Sam Raimi Spider-Man movie trailer that uh, showed Spider-Man foiling a robbery with the Twin Towers uh, being used as a specific set piece to catch a helicopter. Obviously, that trailer was very short-lived given what happened, but... It does kind of make me wonder if maybe Enter Electro was just there as a sort of, yeah, we'll kind of cash in on the popularity of the Neversoft one and then we'll just move on to the movie tie-in games because they're profitable. Which kind of makes me a little bit saddened because you killed an entire interesting Spider-Man continuity in terms of its video games for... And again, no disrespect to the Spider-Man movie games, well, with the possible exception of maybe Spider-Man 3. But is that really worth sacrificing, again, the comic book goodness of the Neversoft and Vicarious Visions games? Because really, I... Speaking personally, I would have preferred a third game in this continuity, which would have been far more interesting to me than, you know, Spider-Man 2's only innovation of chasing balloons and Mysterio and then doing a web-swinging thing of, like, wow, I can alter my direction. It makes me feel like Spider-Man! You know, as opposed to having, you know, cool levels, interesting plots, and just fun overall gameplay. But I suppose this does bring me to another question as well, uh, it, and I, it does also tie into what I was previously saying as well, is uh, how well do movie tie-in games sell purely off the back of the movies, either pre-release or currently in theaters? Because, again, like, I mean, the 2002 Spider-Man movie was advertised at this point, it was obviously a thing, and uh, as is the case with some movie tie-in games, they either, again, work with a movie script and basically create the game based around the events of the film, or they get an earlier version of the script and incorporate elements uh, just to sort of pad out the runtime, which is quite interesting in some aspects because you can see earlier versions of the film, you know, that game designers get to have so that they can create it based on the movie. But at the same time, you also have elements that kind of feel completely... Wacko Jacko, because I mean, I believe in the Spider-Man uh, 1 movie tie-in game, uh, you fight villains like, uh, I think, Kraven the Hunter and uh, Scorpion, who didn't actually appear in the 2002 movie. And I suppose that it was also sort of telling, because I believe Scorpion in the Spider-Man 1 movie game actually uses his, his, uh, his uh, Neversoft design, actually. You know, the blue uh, Scorpion suit with the laser tail that we saw in that game. Why can't these things get easier? I don't know, it's quite odd, really. Maybe that terminal can give me a clue. I don't know, I mean, it's, I'm, not, I'm not really too sure how well movie tie-in games sold, or again, if they were just fodder that people could just sort of buy on a whim, or uh, could easily negate the losses by sales, by making game sales in tandem with box office receipts. I don't really know, I mean, uh, this was also during a time when the whole uh, direct-to-DVD market was really beginning to boom for, you know, companies like Sony and whatever else, so... I don't know, it's uh, strange, really. Yeah, to me, it, uh, the point I'm trying to get at here, really, is that it just feels like a real waste of, you know, killing an interesting Spider-Man thing, just to make, you know, net gains or net losses based on, you know, movie products, which is just... Yeah. I mean, again, there is a reason why movie tie-in games don't exist anymore, because of, you know, games having more inflated budgets than what they used to have, and... Well, in turn, the fact that development time is a lot more costly these days than it was back then, which, uh... Positives and, positives and negatives, really, because on the one hand, you miss out on developers experimenting with, you know, characters and, you know, licenses with gameplay formulas that you otherwise wouldn't see. On the other hand, though, it's also, like, 70% uh, direct, 30% interesting stuff with uh, a little bit of a 15%, with 115% of uh, some really bizarre games. Nice. Shaft, lasers, electric fields, huge crushing... Uh, yes. Something tells me that they took a lot of inspiration from the sewer areas with the Venom chase in the first game of this area. Uh, not quite as tedious, mind you, and uh, we will be doing this again, so study up. This will be on the test, but... Yeah, it's uh, kind of annoying, really. But I mean, it does lead us to at least a slightly more interesting boss fight that can be as easy and hard as you want it to be, but... That will be for later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Uh, let's see, what else do I have? What do I have? What do I have? What do I have? What do I have? I guess to further talk about irrelevant uh, uh, tangents for the time being is that, uh... Hang on a second. Oh, no, wait. Yeah, we go. I've got the trivia. I might as well talk about it again. I mentioned previously that there was a James Cameron-produced Spider-Man movie in the works during the mid-90s, which was part of the reason why both Sandman and Electro couldn't appear in the animated series for the longest time. And, uh, yeah, since Electro was part of this game, Electro was part of the, the James Cameron movie. Fuck, I might as well talk about it. I can't really remember what the plot was specifically about, uh, but I do know that they did apparently have Leonardo DiCaprio lined up as Peter Parker, which, uh... I mean, again... I mean, again, not to discredit the man as an actor or anything, but him playing Peter Parker or Spider-Man, I think, would have been a bit, uh, hmm, not quite very good, because he's kind of... I mean, especially during the 90s, like, I mean, he was a pretty hunky-looking guy, and, uh... It's more of like a... It's more the kind of guy you get to play something like, uh, Harry Osborn or Flash Thompson, more than the, you know, your Peter Parker. But again, like, I mean, apart from having those two as villains, what exactly their roles would have been, I'm not too sure. But, uh, yeah, basically would have focused on Spider-Man being a puberty metaphor, like he would have woken up in his bed, and it's all covered in webs! <laughs> what a funny joke. Yeah, I don't exactly know why the movie was in development hell, since James Cameron was already an established name for himself, both with, you know, uh, both Terminator movies, Alien, uh, The Abyss, uh, was, a uh, no, that would have been before Titanic, actually. But, I mean, even with that, I mean, he already had some hefty film credits under his belt, so, really, I'm just kind of surprised it never really took off. Uh, I don't know, I mean, then again, I guess maybe for the same reason of my apathy towards his film pitch here, maybe film executives felt the same way, or... Yeah, maybe it's more to do with the fact that special effects weren't quite, uh, up to par yet, because, I mean, this was, like, around about the point when CG was only just being established, and... Yeah, seeing a CG- I mean, again, people point out the CG in the Sam Raimi movies nowadays not looking up to snuff, but I mean, I think the only way that you would have had convincing web-swinging in a Spider-Man movie circa, like, the early to mid-90s would have been to... Well, have, like, maybe, like, a crane set up, or have it done, like, in a sort of, like, confined studio setting, which probably wouldn't have looked very good. Although that does actually bring me to a bit of trivia about the 2002 movie uh, as well, where Sam Raimi initially, uh, rather than just using CG, wanted to have like a sp uh, have like a special crane set up where... I don't think it would have been Tobey Maguire in the harness, it probably would have been like a stunt double or something. That they would have legitimately had the crane set up used, uh, kind of similar to how he swings in the PS1 game really, where he goes from like uh, one crane to another, and basically having live action shots of him swinging throughout the city, but... Uh, yeah, Raimi was vetoed on that, primarily for the fact that yeah, that was incredibly dangerous, and if anything went wrong, then the stuntman or Toby himself would have, you know, died. So, uh, yeah, that's why we have no real-life web swinging. Because safety. I mean, I don't know, it would have been fucking ballsy, and like, I mean, considering, like, some stunts you see, like, you know, people scaling buildings, like, uh, in typical, hello, human fly here, or, you know, balancing on the uh, tight ropes to get to specific places on very high rooftops, I don't know, like, I mean, it's possible, but... Then again, I suppose when you're working on a film project as opposed to just some crazy guy doing a stunt, there's probably a little bit more legalese involved, and, uh... Yeah. Scratch that thought. My oh god, this level is still going, but don't worry, not too far to go yet. Uh, apart from a flight fuck up, although really, why the fact- why the fuck that this has so many dis Bizarre security measures is weird to me. And more importantly, well, I mean, again, again, I suppose the fact that it's all electronic is part of why Electro was able to bypass all of this shit, but... At the same time, like, I mean... It seems, it seems weird that they, considering the world that they live in, and the fact that, you know, New York is home to bizarre villains like Doc Ock or Electro or whatever, they kind of wouldn't have prepared for, you know, some foolhardy supervillain to try and take their technology. I mean, especially given that they were working with an electric amplifier, like, I mean, you would have thought that Electro trying to get the goods would have been an eventuality. Yeah, but, oh, well, I suppose if they thought of that, we probably wouldn't have had a game. But in the meantime, it's time for a bus fight. Oh, yeah. Wow. Maybe this wasn't the lizard. This amount of damage would do the Hulk proud. Now, come on, Doc. Give me a sign here. Let me know you're okay. <laughs> Relax! 
Well now, the lizard just took a double dose in scariness, and uh, yeah, you do actually have a brief uh, period here to basically play Final Fantasy X Overdrives in order to basically get the viral samples, which you need in order to severely damage Dr. Codners in his lizard form, so uh... Yeah. He's pretty much invincible without it, so uh... Run away, run away, run away, run away, until he throws you through a wall, through a wall, through a wall, through a wall... And yeah, unlike the lizard as uh, that little cameo you found in the, the previous game, uh, yeah, he's pretty much completely bestial at this point. The High Evolutionary will take great interest in him. Which, actually, on that tangent kind of makes me sad that we never saw the Lizard in Spider-Man Unlimited. Uh, probably would have been for a season two, but... I don't know, I mean, given the fact that the High Evolutionary was experimenting in humans to bestial transformations, and I suppose in that case he could have reversed the process from bestial to humans? Curious. Uh, but yeah, basically you have, like, three attempts to shoot Dr. Connors with the viral samples, uh, the cartridges do respawn, but you only have three shots to get your webbing into him, so you can take him down. It's, uh, yeah, try not- try not to go up against the lizard directly, because again, he is quite powerful. And, uh, yeah, everything else just sort of pips you, but otherwise you should be good. Just, to uh, make sure you don't run out of, uh, CARTRIDGES! As is the typical, oh no, I'm out of webbing! Cut to a commercial break, slash tune in for the next comic book issue, but... Speaking of tuning in next time, uh, tune in next time for more Spider-Man antics. I'm Solid Scully, keep a new metal, and I'll catch you next time. Bye bye lizard lips. What happened to you? Electro was here. He wanted information on the BioNexus project. He's assembled all the parts, but he's still not able to make it work. What is this BioNexus device? It amplifies the bioelectric energy in living beings. On Electro, it'll make him a god. You have to stop him, Spider-Man. But how do I stop him, Doc? What's he missing? I don't know what it is. Dr. Watts kept all the secret notes about the final phase of the project secret. Go to her lab. It's on the other side of the complex. Thanks, Doc. Whoops. Hold where you are, Spider-Man! Failure to comply will result in the use of force! Sorry, boys and girls, but I don't think I'm going to let you arrest me today.